First of all, let me express my gratitude uh, to the KDA Central Asia Forum for providing us with the platform and to Yehor Vyshnevsky for his support. And of course, to our uh, distinguished speaker, Yaroslav Fritzak for joining us today. Uh, so I will just uh, briefly share my screen with you. And um, yeah, okay. So, oops. So my name is Evelyn and I'm a PhD student at Seoul National University and here I'm representing an initiative, the Ghosts of Kyiv, that emerged in response to the tragedy inflicted by the Russian Federation's full-scale invasion uh, to, uh, of Ukraine. And uh, before giving the floor to our distinguished speaker, I would like to just briefly mention who we are and what we do. So the Ghosts of Kyiv uh, aims to spread awareness in Korea about the war unfolding in our country and to connect Korean and Ukrainian um, academic professionals through the lectures, panel discussions and roundtables. Our vision is free and independent Ukraine and we advocate that Ukraine as a sovereign and independent state has the very right to decide its own future and direction. And we are very open to communication, uh, to new ideas, maybe partnerships, so you can follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, or email us um, all of your ideas, so feel free. And uh, also after the end of the lecture, we will ask you to fill uh, the survey because your opinion is very important uh, for us. So um, we convinced that everyone is capable to make a change and the Russian aggression against Ukraine has shown that together we are strong and united as never before. But the strength and unity are um, born from both collective and individual actions. So every person can make a difference and any help is important and valuable. So for example, um, those whose values uh, correspond to our values could support us by joining the peaceful uh, protests, raising awareness and most importantly, sharing the truth about this brutal war. Uh, the violence is escalating and heavy fighting, shelling and airstrikes across civilian infrastructure have devastating consequences for Ukraine. Hundreds of thousands of people are staying under the occupation, some with no access to food, water, electricity and medicine. And numerous homes were destroyed, millions of people had to flee their hometowns. And the situation is very critical and uh, financial and humanitarian assistance is needed uh, as unfortunately Russia continues the war against Ukraine. So here I just wanted to briefly mention some of the initiatives uh, that uh, have been uh, created by the government. So for example, you can see the United 24. Uh, it's an initiative, global initiative that was created by the president of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky. Uh, in order to uh, gather the donations that will be distributed for the defense, humanitarian and medical assistance and reconstruction of Ukraine. Uh, additionally, the Embassy of Ukraine um, in the Republic of Korea has opened a special account for donations of humanitarian help. And then let's not forget about the animals who too are victims of this war and currently many shelters and those are simply blocked from the provisions. And you can just buy a ticket to the zoo or donate to some of the Ukrainian NGOs like your animals that supports the animals right now. And yeah, uh, then thank you for your attention uh, to our initiative. And uh, finally, we are very, very happy to present the, our distinguished speaker, Yaroslav Hritsak. Yaroslav Hritsak is one of the most prominent contemporary Ukrainian historians, and uh, we are very honored uh, that uh, he agreed to, to join us today. Uh, he is a professor of history at the Ukrainian Catholic University. He is a doctor honoris causa at the National University of Kiev Mahila Academy. He is a chief editor of the academic journal Ukraine Modern, a member of the supervisory board of Harvard Ukrainian Studies, a lecturer at Columbia University, Central European University and Harvard Summer School. Additionally, Yaroslav Kritsak is an author of numerous academic publications, and here just to briefly show you a few in English, 
and particularly his work on Ivan Franco. And um, then he also has uh, obviously a very extensive list of the publications uh, in Ukrainian. Uh, furthermore, Yaroslav Fritzak is the owner of many uh, academic awards. And uh, we are enormously thankful to the Professor Hritzak for being our speaker today. So please welcome him uh, on the stage. And I will be I will be demonstrating my uh, his presentation for you. Thank you so much, dear Evelyn. <clears throat> Thank you for a beautiful presentation. And I'm very embarrassed to say that I missed the date. I open, I log in into Zoom 10 minutes to nine to 10. And then I found out that it says it starts at 11. So I went to the coffee shop. And exactly at the moment I was buying coffee shop, I get a message that the, 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 the Zoom is already started. So I'm very, very sorry. It happens sometimes, this mass calculations giving the difference of time. I really thought it must be at 11 o'clock, but in any case, I'm sorry for this delay and I hope you will pardon me. So uh, we are going to talk about, and we were going to talk about uh, war and history. In a sense, they're very closely interrelated. But I was thinking hard how to start this uh, presentation uh, and I was looking for a kind of the similarities between Ukrainian and Korean history, some kind of entanglements. And I found any harder person to start with, like with this young man. Could you have a next slide, Evelyn, if you please? This is a mayor of Mykolaiv. This is one of the biggest city on Ukraine, on Ukraine, on the Black Sea shore. And you could see for his name, he is a Korean. His name is Vitaly Kim, and he's a symbol nowadays in Ukraine of uh, resistance. Uh, he is extremely cold. He is symbol of resilient. He uh, he actually he heads the kind of the resistance, Ukraine resistance against the Russian army, which stands nearby. And he also has an extremely good sense of humor, and therefore he is very lovely. He is one of the three main people which is now adored in in, in Ukraine. This is him. And this is probably the best way to start our story because we have a Korean who is now one of the main historical he hero in Ukraine. But that said, it's a larger context because you have to just to get to, to the idea that this is, looks, for many countries outside, it looks very rather strange because uh, mayor of the largest city, which stands strong, is a Korean. And by the way, many says that he could be next president given his popularity and charisma in Ukraine. The current president is a Jew, and the commander of Ukrainian army is is is, is a Ukrainian, and the head of the uh, the largest party is a Georgian. So this is something which could hardly say said could be somehow brought to mind. How come? How come we have such a multicultural, multi-ethnic command into Ukraine? And this gives us something about nowadays state in Ukraine and the war itself. Uh, there has been, I'm not a war expert, uh, uh, but I follow the expertise of the, those who knows really well what, what the, what, what's going on the field. And one of my favorite uh, experts is Michael, Michael Kaufman, the United States expert. And he has his own uh, blog, uh, his podcast, which is called War on the Rocks. And recently he was discussing his guest, a possibility, a kind of worst case scenario. What would happen? if Zelensky, the now our president, would be assassinated at the very first days of the war. And basically they came to conclusion that this would be actually a tragedy. Tragedy both for Ukraine and for Zelensky family, but it, didn't, it wouldn't affect the war that much. Because the reason is the way Ukrainians wage the war, in a sense that every mayor of the city like Kim behaves like a little president, which means that the initiative comes from below. And every mayor of the city could, doesn't, doesn't wait for a command from, the, from, the, from above and they behave very independently. And this is very much symbol of Ukraine. And I believe that some of you may read yesterday uh, the article in Guardian, which basically says, according to the British, British experts, that Putin, plans the uh, op op operation, more operation, military operation than bus on the level on the colonel and the brigade, which is very low level. And this has given you probably the best introduction to my lecture. What is the sense of difference between Ukraine and Russia? It's not that much about language or religion. In this sense, they are rather similar to some extent, but seeming so they're different, but 
let's say it's both different and similar, but the main difference is the kind of political organization. Because here you have a command of very young people. They are around four, 35, 40 years, and each of them acts independently, and they've been the war, it's on the Ukrainian side. And on the Russian side, you have somebody who has a built a strong vertical of, of, of power, and he interferes in the very small details. He doesn't rely on his uh, subordinates, and therefore this is kind of the main difference, a kind of vertical society, organized society versus uh, horizontal organized society, authoritarianism versus democracy. In this case of war, you could finish, in this sense, you could finish our lecture because it's very hard, very easy, easily to predict who wins the war. Basically, in the nowadays uh, circumstances, those who are uh, uh, horizontal oriented, has a much initiative and much spirit, they are bound to win the war. But this is not the, I'm again, I'm not the expert, I'm talking about the history, because what P Putin claims basically, that this war is about history. May I have a next slide? And basically, could you click twice? Mm -hmm. Or several times until you have all the images, yeah. And the last one, yeah, exactly. Thank you so much, Hillary. So basically, this is the war about this entity, the large entity which you see on the screen, uh, on the on your on your uh, right, and this is so-called Rus. This is the oldest state in this territory. Again, it's Rus, but not Russia. Uh, in nowadays, historians not call them Russians, called Ruthenians because it's quite different different entity. And this is exactly what Putin claims he's old on. He believes that the oldest territory must be nowadays reunited within the, within, within the nowadays uh, Russia. And basically he believed this has been a Russian state, which is, I would say, a total, total, how to say, total historical misunderstanding. Not just misunderstanding, misunderstanding just, just, just make a nonsense. Because in these times, there has been no national states, there were rather empires. And basically talking about this uh, Rus state, it was empire, multicultural empire, multi-ethnic culture, uh, multi-ethnic empire, when the elites were made by the Scandinavians, Scandinavians so-called Varangians or Normans. You probably follow this Netflix serial serials or see the, 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 the recent movie Northmen. So basically this is them. And this is small tribe, very military tribe, very warlike tribe, which installed control over this territory because they were both uh, soldiers and traders. And they were trading the road from the, from the North Scandinavia to the South, to the Black Sea uh, shore, to Constantinople. At that time, the largest, uh, largest city in this part of the world. And so thank you for showing this here. Yeah. So in the middle of this state was exactly key. And this is where they came and they came and they hold this power. And this was exactly when the state emerged. And they imposed their control over this vast territory, which was very mixed. A larger part of this territory was made by different Slavonic tribes or peoples. Another part was made hunger of Finnish people and some other people of the steppe. And uh, just to provide some kind of the unit of the state, they uh, accepted uh, uh, Christianity from Byzantium. And therefore this region became Orthodox. But basically it was only rule, dynasty and religion that united this territory. Otherwise they were very, very, very much diversified and diverse. So to say, if you want to have a clear vision, you could compare with another empire of that size and this importance at that time, but this is empire of the Charlemagne, Carl the Great, or at the sake empire of the Franks, exactly on this other side of European continent. It was empire that extended the nowadays territory of France, Germany, and Italy. So basically it's a make nonsense to claim this was a French, German, or Italian state. It was not, because basically there was origin of all these kind of nations, but there was not of this, of this, of this nation. For sure, until the uh, Second World War, uh, French and Germans claimed these territories as their own, and Hitler was probably very, very, very famous that believed that this was the German Empire. In this sense, Putin is very much like uh, Hitler. At least his frame of mind about history is very much similar. But again and again, I have to say, it, it's what not a national state. There has been no nation at that time yet. It was a large empire from which the story has started. May I have another slide, Ivalin? So uh, historians have their rules, and one of the rules is probably the main rule, I'll say golden rule of history, that past is a different country. They do, diff they do all the things different there. So what I meant to say, that what Putin makes a huge mistake or miscalculation, that he sees on the past, into the past, with the glasses of a nowadays. 
he tries to apply the nowadays notion to the past, which doesn't really, doesn't really work because exactly historians know that history is very much, the past is very much different than the nowadays. And just to make the story, the long story short, I just want to say that nowadays we have a, one of the main crucial divide in Europe, in Europe and also in the world, it's a West East. West East means old Europe and it's, it's, it's offsprings like the United States and Canada and Australia and the rest is the East. So this is nowadays the, the main division that we get used to, but it didn't work. It's very modern division. It is division that emerged more or less in, by the end of 18th at the 19th century. Before that, there was another axis, another divide. And the divide was not west-east, but south-north. And south was a, a center of civilization, which is both the west of the Mediterranean, Mediterranean region with the Byzantine Empire, Roman Empire, ancient Greece, and the north was a barbaric region. Barbaric, not the same that they were just, how to say, really barbaric, but it was different. Basically, there has been no state, no religion, they're mostly, they're mostly pagans, all the kind of things. Let's put it this way. There has been no, no books in this region because basically one of the clear dividing line between civilization and barbarian is a written text and the religion. So there are nothing like that. So what I'm saying there, that this was the main dividing line. And if you look on this space, which is called Rus, this was also divided in North and South. So this was North and South and Ukraine emerged from the South and Russia emerged from the, from the North. But again, in later time, they called it a region Little uh, Russia, Little Rus, excuse me, Little Rus and Great Rus. Which means Little Rus was Ukraine and uh, Great Rus was Rus, Russia. Which gives you kind of impression that Great Russia was a, a bigger, older, or they called it bigger, older brother. And Ukraine is a senior, a junior brother. Which is again a nonsense because it's very much 19th, 20th century notion. Because at that time, at the time of the ancient Rome and Greece, the great and the little has another meaning, quite different meaning. Great, little mean a core, a core of civilization, something which is in the south, from which, from which the south, uh, according to, uh, in the result of the some colonization, the ex territory extended into barbaric zone. And then you have this kind of like, which is a big or, or, or big or, uh, or, or great. So let us say like, a, a, very much difference between Little Greece, which is original Greece, the homeland of Socrates or Plato, and Great Greece, the territory which was colonized from, say, from the Gibraltar to Turkey, or uh, Little Poland versus Great Poland. You probably not that much familiar with the Polish history, but give you one example: Great Britain. We know that there is Great Britain. We don't know where is Little Britain, but Little Britain is the French shore. It's exactly from where Norman has, so say, extended into British territory. So what I'm saying here, when you say something little and great, it, it doesn't about the size. Size doesn't matter. This. It's about the hierarchy and quality, which means basically small is less. Less, less, is, less. less is more and small is beautiful because small is a core. Small is a core of civilization or Christianity or written text or the kind of thing. And the territory which extended barbaric zone is exactly great. So to say, and just to give you another example, see you see, see here on behind, beneath you see the kind of the uh, picture of Kiev, the center of this Rus, and see how it emerged from 1996 to AOI. But that time there was been nothing in Moscow, just a forest, so to say. So this will give you an idea who was older and who was younger, younger. And again, we quite often see Ukraine in the in the shadow of the Russian history which is again very much uh, oversimplification because Russia, a Russian fact in Ukraine history is very much late, it's a late cover. Because until this time, most of the connections that this territory, South of Ukraine, South of Rus has, now blue future Ukraine was most to the South and to the West, rather to the North and the East. Here you see on the picture on the right, the marriages of the king, of the you know, daughters and sons of king of, of you even kings, and you see most of them has been to the west and to the south. Uh, uh, you may easily uh, trace uh, these marriages by the some names which emerged from this territory, which became something normal amongst the many monarchs in the Europe, like uh, Philip, like uh, Andrew, or more importantly, Valdemar, 
which is very much connected with Vladimir, very much like Vladimir, Vladimir, Vladimir uh, uh, Putin. But this is basically uh, the same name has a different, a different, different rendering. But uh, difference is that Vladimir is pronounced Ukrainian way, or Vladimir is pronounced Russian way. And nowadays, if you look on the scriptures, the written text, the still, the still, the still available in Kiev, text from the 10th, 12th century, you have that they have a form of Vladimir rather than Vladimir, which means Ukrainian form or and then Russian form. Those are some other, some some other proofs that shows that the language, or rather say uh, dialect of this territory, because there's no language but that time was a dialect, which much closer to the nowadays Ukrainian language than to Russian. So what I'm saying here, Ukraine has a much more claims to this territory, uh, basically on these historical rights, because but they were older and they're much more connection, both geographically, politically, and most importantly, their connections to the West, which is part of their identity. They seem to sell larger than Western, than Northern or Eastern. May I have a, the next slide, if you please? Uh, this territory, this ruse, has largely disappeared uh, with the uh, with the, the start, with the uh, attacks of Mongols. Uh, actually, uh, this is something else that uh, uh, makes Korean and Ukrainian history uh, entangled, connect, and this is exactly the fact of our Asian state step. We start with Manchuria, go through Mongolia, then the South Altan Mines, Mountains, the South of the Siberia, Kazakhstan. Uh, 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 this for Russia and and in Ukraine and then in Hungary and Romania, and this is large belt, large belt, some kind of highway for the nomadic nomadic tribes, which were looking for uh, new pastures, also looking on the way other tribes, other people, and other storing other states, and they will mostly will go from west, from east to west, and actually China and Korea has also dispatched giving the, the the Mongols invasions later on. So basically what Mongols did, they came here, they destroyed the center of this uh, territory, which was Kyiv, the capital city of Kyiv. And but before the destruction, Kyiv was among the top largest cities in Europe. After that, when Kyiv was destroyed in 1240 by Mongols, it was relegated to the small provincial town. And then regained its status and size only by the end of the 19th century. And it very much resembles the uh, story of ancient Rome. Ancient Rome was the largest uh, city in the ancient uh, Europe, which has been destroyed by the Hans and Attila, and then has been resurrected by its size and status on the 19th century. Which also gives you the idea that we have a certain zone in Europe, which has been uh, very politically unstable, and which lost its uh, status uh, because of this uh, invasion, so to say. And in this sense, Kyiv is very much similar, similar, similar uh, 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 to, to Rome, and both has the same, same, same source, source because basically those tribes who destroyed both Rome's and uh, Rome and, and uh, Kyiv, they came for this large Eurasian uh, 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 step. So what I'm uh, saying here that step was a, a large destabilizing factor in this territory and it distracted a lot of energy and efforts for these uh, people of the north, uh, north of the steppe, to say to, to uh, instead of focus on their political or cultural development, they have to focus themselves on the, how to defend themselves from this constant, constant uh, danger. So what it basically brought those, brought a uh, final point was that it brought to some kind of total no nightmare. I'll say Koshma. May I have a next slide, if you please? May I have a next slide? Yeah. Yes, yeah, sorry. It's That's okay. That phrased. So what you have as a result, this is the territory where I'm talking to, which is basically nowadays Ukraine. You have a, a destruction of the capital city. And this city ceased to exist as a center, geopolitical center, as a state of great entity until the beginning of 20th century. And as I said, that uh, very much like nature, politics doesn't tolerate a vacuum. So what we have as a result, the many states, neighboring states, pulled into this region trying to get control 
over this region. And the price was very high because there's another dimension which makes this Ukrainian history very much particularly. It was immense richness of the sources. Ukraine has a, a symbol, but has been a symbol of European Palestine, the land of milk and honey, so to say. This is the image you could find quite often in the text starting for the 15th, 16th, 15th, 16th century. Uh, text was produced in the, in the West, in, in, in Europe. And basically the reason was that Ukraine has one of the largest belt of the Black Earth, which is extremely fertile territory. And in any sense, you see this, uh, the statistics here, the Ukrainians have a number one Black Earth in the world. So basically this is that, 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 that Ukraine has always been attractive, kind of the target for, 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 for uh, many, many uh, uh, neighbors to attack and to get into this territory. So in this sense, uh, these uh, resources, the richness of resources was both blessing and curse. Blessing was that basically when you live in Ukraine, you have better standards of living. You'll probably live longer, you'll be fed better, you'll be clothed better, so to say. And this is something which plays the better standards. But the course was that everybody want to be there. And basically the one way to be there is to conquer this territory. And this ter this territory in one of the most highly contested region in Europe. May I have a next slide? So here is the map. Here is the map. You see the nowadays country, nowadays uh, Ukraine with the neighboring uh, regions, with neighboring countries. And you see this kind of the overlapping patterns. Each pattern is a nation or state or empire which tried to impose its control over Ukraine. And uh, uh, the, the story was that you could hardly see any region in Ukraine that has been not contested at least by two uh, super superpowers. We have an invasion from the north. And this was Scandinavians and then later Swedes in 17th, 17th century. You have invasions from the south, which was uh, Turks and Tatars. They have invasion from, from, from West, which is basically Poles and Germans. And then you have an Eastern neighbor, which is Russia, which has been invading Ukraine, like it was is now, is nowadays. So what I see here is this kind of duplicate nightmare. This lack of any stability, very much contested territory and local people should put to a very high price because it's one of the most dangerous places to live in the world. Uh, uh, it was like a, a war against all of, against all. If you know this Hobbesian notion, the, this is exactly uh, the, 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 the when this Hobbesian notion un, uh, unfortunately uh, came, came true. And basically it was contested because of this region, because of the fact that this was where empires and nations contested each other and also nations between themselves. And therefore making of one nation or one empire was destruction of another empire. So basically when I'm turned to, this is Palestine, but in other meaning. It's not just biblical Palestine, lands of, land of milk and honey. It's also one of the most contested regions in the world. And not just one contested region, the region is that what goes there in this region have an impact on the larger politics, including even sometimes in global politics. If you look what's going on in Palestine nowadays or 200, 2000 years ago, you could easily guess that this is something that has impact on the global history. And we see nowadays the same way that what we have in Ukraine, the Russian Ukrainian war could easily turn, unfortunately to say that, in the Third World War. So basically this is the same point that you have a very contested territory, which could be some say, say Palestine of the Eastern Europe. May I have a next slide? So none of the state of this territory lasted more than three centuries. But one of the largest, longest here to stay was a Lithuanian state that later on turned into Polish Lithuanian state. You see it below. This is the largest state which was between the Baltic Sea and, and, and Black, Black Sea. Basically from Berlin until Smolensk, which is a huge territory. Very much like Arus, with very much multi-ethnic. It has a Poles, Lithuanians, uh, nowadays Belarusian Ukrainians, and also a large large share of, of Jews, probably the, 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 the largest part of Jews was living exactly in this, in this, in this state. But in this state, the, the local population, the Slav, the, the Rus population made approximately a half of the state. 
and they were Orthodox. The other half were made by Poles, Lithuanians, which is both the Catholics. But even so, the state was being divided and be, 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 be multi, multi religious. Uh, Ruthenians enjoyed some kind of rights and privileges in this state, especially Lithuania. Even so, the Lithuanian state, the language of the state has been Ruthenian, Ruthenian state. So basically, what I'm saying here that this state, this state, has a two important effects on Ukrainian history. First of all, it saved future Belarusian and Ukrainian from the Mongol yoke. Because basically it was very, the Mongol yoke didn't last a year for a long. Uh, uh, Lithuanians, uh, Lithuanians retook the control of this territory. And basically this was territory was uh, around, uh, a part, a site of the Mongol, Mongol empire, which was, not the, which was not the case in the North. The North, you have an emergence of a new small uh, kingdom, which later on uh, evolved in the uh, empire, which was the Russian empire. But this was basically uh, made on the impact of Mongol control. And basically they have a kind of privileged state within, within Mongol state. So what you have there, you have not one, but two Rus, Rus of South and Rus of uh, North. And the importance was that this Rus of South was a part of European history, very much like a Rus before that, because basically it was the um, territory of Catholicism. And uh, as they say, uh, uh, West came into Ukraine, as well as Belarus, Belarus, West came into Ukraine in the Polish dress, and which means that it brought a many notion and political concept, which was absent in the North. And one of the main concepts was that the uh, power of monarch was very limited. Uh, a monarch in Pol Polish Lutheran state could uh, rule but could not govern because his government was limited by the local nobility. They're called Schlachter, you see them below, Polish Schlachter, which is basically very much East to Western concept. They have had enormous, enormous rights, so to say, but basically they have something like you could have uh, the uh, British nobles, which means they have a habeas corpus. Uh, to put other words, a uh, monarch could not punish them physically. Only their own court could punish, judge and punish the, uh, one of them. So basically they were, their rule was nothing above us without us. And this is very much, if you say, if you, be, if you would be born in 17th century, probably to be born a Polish noble would be the best option. Because uh, by the by the size of the privileges and the privileged enjoyment of life was very much enormous. Nobody could stay even close to them. And uh, in uh, strict contracts of that, the Russian nobility, see this picture on, on above, was has no rights. In terms, they could have a kind of they could be presided of their or their, their own serfs, which is the peasants. But in comparison, in relation to uh, to uh, Tsar or Empire, they were they were they were uh, serfs themselves. They were denied any kind of uh, political, political, political rights. So basically what you see here, it's a, a different notion of relationship between the state and the society. Society at this term has been uh, represented by nobility because nobody has uh, political rights that but, not, but nobility, otherwise was served. But, but still, the concept was that here we have a kind of political tradition, which basically said the state could not be strong. It has to be limited. And the society has to enjoy specific, specific rights and liberties. And this is something that has a very big impact on differences between Ukraine and Russia. Of this, this political tradition. May I have a next slide? And the main embodiment of these differences has been Ukrainian Cossacks. Ukrainian Cossacks has been a kind of very particular uh, phenomenon which has uh, many similarities in the world. Think about American cowboys, which probably would be the same, very closest, closest similarity. Uh, if you know this kind of Western, uh, Hollywood, uh, Hollywood Westerns, they're very much talking about the history of the Wild West. So uh, Ukraine is very much similar in the sense, but one difference. Where well, United States is wild west, Ukraine has a wild east. And here, so this wild east, very much like wild west, you have a kind of the borderland figure. Somebody who dares to live there. This is territory of, of danger, but also liberty. 
And this is where Ukrainian closet has emerged. They were living on the borders of the society, both socially, culturally, and geopolitically, and politically. And, but uh, they were warriors, and they enjoyed liberties. There was life was adventurous, but, but, but free. In a sense, we have the same Cossacks in Russia as well, in uh, Don, in Ural, but there's a difference there. The difference there is that Ukrainian Cossack was very much affected by the Polish or other words, the Western culture. Uh, you could hardly imagine somebody of Russian Cossack speaking French or Latin, which is quite norm for Ukrainian Cossacks, because most of the elites were very much either, either were members of the Polish nobility themselves or emulated their behavior on the patterns of the Polish nobility. And they know the concept of this kind of the liberty and their they, 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 they rights. So what I'm saying here that uh, they provided a uh, elite for a new state that emerged there later on. Uh, uh, Cossacks rebelled uh, uh, against the Polish state when the Polish state put, uh, tried to put a pressure on the Orthodox religion. So they rebelled. And as a result of the victory, they created uh, 1864, 1648, created their own state. Uh, under, under the leadership of Bodan Khmelnytsky, the most famous Ukrainian Cossacks who, who graduated from one of the best schools, who knew, who knew ma many languages, who could read Machiavelli, all the kind of things, which could give you the idea, so to say. So he created the state and he brought the state to the Russian Empire. The reason being is that uh, he uh, believed, uh, wrongly so, that uh, since this is the empire which has orthodox religion, they could live peacefully together. So this is where exactly a Russian factor comes into Ukrainian history. And may I have a next slide? slide? So uh, now let's talk about Russia and the Russian empire. Russia was a huge empire. In the world history was the third largest empire in the world. But there has been a problem. Russia was a huge empire, but backward empire. It doesn't have a resources to govern all these huge territories. Most of all, doesn't have, didn't have a educated elites. And what happened then, since the Ukrainian leaders, Cossacks, came into Russian empire and they, they and their offsprings, since they were educated, they provided the first elites for the Russian empire. Uh, just give you some kind of idea, in the 18th century, according to some estimations, the half of the old so-called Russian elite was made by Ukrainian or little Russian. In a sense, Ukrainian played the role like a Scot did with the British Empire. They paved this, uh, this empire, uh, they waved toward the world glory, so to say, because they believe this is their empire. And basically this, in one sense, this is even their, their empire, because many of Ukrainians has a leading positions in St. Petersburg, and they were talking about the uh, little Russian, uh, little, little, little Russian colony, which uh, governed the governed, uh, Russian Empire in the 18th, 18th century. And there are so many Ukrainians which are on the serve of the Russian Empire that by the 19th century, you could uh, hardly track the origins because they're starting to they assimilate. But some leading figures, which you know as the Russian figures, they have been ethnic Ukrainian origin, say, say Chakhov or Mayakovsky just to give you a few examples of Ahmad, Ahmatova, the, Russian, the, Russian, the famous Russian, Russian, Russian poet, or even to some extent Dostoevsky. The oldest people who came from Barland, mostly from the, this Ukrainian Ukrainian territory. And probably the, the most telling example is Gorbachev himself. Gorbachev is not <coughs> Ukrainian. He spoke Ukrainian. He, he, was, he, was, he was boasting himself that he knew Ukrainian poetry very, very, very much, very well. And basically the story is, the, since the 18th century, and then again in the Soviet Union after after death of Stalin, Ukrainians were treated as a as a minor as a minor brothers, as a ma minor partners in the in the ruling of the of the empire. They said that uh, Soviet Union has collapsed because the three last uh, general secretaries, the leaders of Communist Party, uh, could not speak properly Russian. They speak Russian with a heavily Ukrainian accent, which is basically a joke, but it gives you the idea, the impact of the Ukrainian building in the Russian empire. 
But there was a price for that. May I have a next slide? They could build this empire, very unlike in Scots, Scots, Scottish example, they could build the empire only on the price that they have to give up their identity. They could not be Ukrainians, which was not the case in the Scotland, in Britain, because Scotland, Scots remain to be in Scots. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, uh, the price was simulation. And probably one of the most telling point was that Ukrainian language has been forbidden in the Russian Empire, not once, but twice, by the end of the 19th century. In the Soviet Empire, there has been Russified and denied historical memory. And basically, the list of started when the Russia started to get control, monopoly over Ukrainian history. And this has kind of, kind of distortion since then. And this distortion is very wide but spread in the West. Uh, I believe also probably in Korea and China and in Japan, because they're very much dominated, with the, with the, from, dominated by the Russian scholars or the scholars who were related to Russia. And basically the story was that as a result of these manipulations, Ukrainians just disappeared from these narratives. And they, they uh, says that uh, uh, Ukrainians were presented as Russians when did something good, and as Ukrainians we did something wrong. So this is a kind of the Ukrainian, which uh, very like, a, very much like a, in the game, chill, chill again. Now you see it, now you don't. So starting from the 19th, 20th century, Ukraine is less and less visible. And another part of the story, that part of this Russian or Soviet discourse was that uh, uh, Russia, the West was presented as a peril that always endangers Ukraine and Russia, as only way to Ukraine to be safe will be under the ages of the Kremlin, so to say. So Russia was presented as a safe abode, as a shelter for Ukrainians. So basically there was no escape for Ukrainians, but to stay within the Russian empire. May I have a next slide? It never happened. It never happened because Ukraine has never been sealed, never been isolated, and this Western influences was still going on, specifically in the 19th century, with emerging of new isms, new ideologies, national and social romanticism, and probably the main embodiment is Taras Shevchenko, is a leading Ukrainian figure, leading poet. Uh, in a sense, you probably know this kind of notion that in Western Europe, uh, nations were made by politicians, in Eastern Europe, nations were made by the poets. You could hear, have uh, Pushkin in Russia, Mitzkevich in uh, Poland, Sandor Petefi in Hungary, uh, Kolasa in, Be in Belarus, all of them are so-called national poets, they were national symbols. They are poetry which created the nations. So this is Shevchenko case. And Shevchenko case was very much particular, kind of the real kind of miracle, because it was kind of surf, well, like a zope in the ancient, ancient, ancient uh, Rome. This is somebody who emerged from the very uh, low uh, strata from the serfs and made a huge, huge career as a, as a kind of the leading Leading symbol, living symbol, living symbol, and uh, wrote a uh, genius poetry, so to say. But basically, the story is that himself, Shevchenko embedded this kind of the of the madness of the new Ukrainian identity. It was by, by it was largely based on the Cossack myth, on the memory of the Cossack state and the Cossack themselves. They they fought, they fight for for freedom, but this was very much heavily influenced by the Western influences by the socialism, nationalism, all the kind of thing, rom romantism. Uh, so what I'm saying here that in 19th century, if Ukraine would be relegated to Russia only, most likely Ukraine would disappear. But luckily now, there's a significant part of Ukraine which was outside of the Russian, Russian, Russian uh, inflect or control, and even, even elites were high, uh, most of the elites in Ukrainian territory were not Russian, they were rather Poles or Germans, and it gives you the idea this kind of the westernizing effect. Uh, to put it simple, if you have a kind of very simple formula between uh, Rus and Ukraine, uh, let's imagine Rus as a kind of caterpillar and Ukraine and Russia and Belarus as a butterflies that came when be born as a result of this destruction of this caterpillar. So what I'm saying here, making of Ukraine was in a sense, destruction of Rus because there was kind of different entities, different also there's kind of uh, similarities between them, there's some continuity to them, but at the same time are very much, very much different. But if I, if I to describe this kind of differences, so Ukraine is Rus plus West, because Ukraine 
has emerged as a very much westernized Rus, the westernized realm of the Orthodox civilization. And this made a base of Ukrainian identity. If Ukraine is Rus plus West, then Russia himself, especially by the end of the 19th century, narrated differently Rus as Rus minus West. So you have a kind of very much different notion. Ukraine is Rus plus West, Russia as Rus minus West. Because in Russia, one of the dominating discourse was that West presents a danger for the Russian state. So therefore it has been treated very much separately, quite often as an enemy. And in Ukraine, it was very much different because Ukraine, West was still something like a part of the identity. May I have a next slide. And most of this nation making was made in the territory, Ukraine territory outside of Russian empire. It was a house empire. It was a small region, approximately 15, 20 percent percentage of territory, but extremely important for the producing of the language, of history, all the kind of symbols, Ukrainian identity. It was my native city of Lviv, where I'm talking from, from, from now. And you have all this kind of the leaders of the, of the territory. And basically, they created this new Ukrainian identity, which was very much, in this sense, was very much leftist socialist. And they believed it's very much universal, so to say. So their ambition was to place Ukraine into your European world. And from Lviv, they exported this idea to Kyiv. And this is where this Kyiv became a new capital. And this is basically, physically, it was in Russian empire, but culturally, culturally very much, it was also part of the Europe and the Western part of the world. It was very much contested city. It was contested between Poles, Russians, and Ukrainians. Uh, it could be probably come as a surprise to you that in the middle of 19th century, the main spoken language in Kyiv was not Russian, but Polish. But Ukraine, to a large extent, emerged as a kind of contest between the Russian nationalism, Russian uh, empire, and the Polish nationalism. Uh, like uh, between Anvil and Hammer. This is the spark that emerged between uh, Anvil and Hammer. And this provided with a kind of the hybrid identity, because basically Ukraine used as a kind of resource of the Russian empire, but the software came from the West. So therefore we have this kind of Ukrainian identity. So if I made the next slide. If you're talking since in 19th century, it's basically was idea of Ukraine, software we must say, but the turns into hardware at the 20th century. And the Turning point is the uh, First World War, because First World War created a kind of a Ukrainian question. Ukrainian question as a kind of the question of great geopolitics. There was simple rule, has, has a control over this territory, of its huge resources, of the geographical position, has the best chances to win the war, be it First World War or the Second World War. A few years ago, there has been published a, a monograph by the leading British historian, Dominic Levin. This is the monograph or book on the Russia and the First World War. And the opening sentence in this uh, book sounds like that, that most of all, what uh, the, uh, the fate of the First World War depended on what was going in and about Ukraine. It was very much in the First World War. It was very much in the Second World War. Uh, Hannah Arendt, the name which you may know, has written in his Origins of Totalism that if Hitler would uh, impose in UK Ukrainian flag instead of the uh, Nazi swastika, most likely he would win the war. It never happened because otherwise he wouldn't be Hitler. But basically it was Stalin who played the Ukrainian card much more masterfully than Hitler. But basically the story is simple. You have a Ukrainian question, it has to be resolved. Because, and who has the, this kind of solution to this kind of key to this kind of Ukraine, key, key to Ukraine question, could control the larger territory. And in this sense, in this sense, that Ukraine was a, has a key position in the preservation of the Russian empire and the later Soviet state. It was not, it was not just another territory, it was a crucial territory, it was an important territory for this, for the, for the, for this large, large reason. And Looking from the other, other, other uh, the perspective, the emergence of Ukrainian question as a question of geopolitics gave a spur, a rise to Ukrainian nation building. Basically, Ukrainian nation was built 
within the flames of the war and revolutions, starting from 1914 until the 1945. This is a very important point to make because Ukraine as a modern ethnic, as a state emerged in this time, exactly. And it, since it has been a product of a violence, of the military violence, war violence, revolutionary violence, it still have a very heavy best marks. Trauma is birth, which could be discussed, discussed separately. But I, to make a short, long story short, I would just to show you one uh, graph, if I may, the next slide. Here we have a life expectancy of Ukrainians throughout the 20th century, separately for males and females, because you know, for a variety of the reasons, females tend to live longer than males, and therefore we have to make the separate, separate, separate uh, graphs. And also you may know that uh, life expectancy is probably one of the best criteria to judge the well-being of society. So this is a, you have a, this uh, bold uh, red line or bold orange line is uh, the line for Ukrainians. And the thin gray lines is the uh, life expectancy in the Western Europe. And you could clearly see this difference, tragic, dramatic difference, some kind of, some point, dramatic, tragic differences that Ukrainians tend to live shorter, sometimes very shorter than most of West Europeans. So why West Europeans didn't suffer from such kind of, or kind of the turmoils and the political instability, this was the main story of Ukrainians. And you could see probably everywhere with some exception of the 60s, the lucky 60s is kind of exception, but there was a two huge gaps and the gaps is 1942 and 1933. We well, could see here the gap between the average Ukrainian, average European uh, 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 raised to 40 years or so, 30, 30, 40 years. It's a imagined gap. And then again, if you look at this map, you could get idea of this tragedy. In the, 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 uh, the, you have a 1933, 1942. 1942 is a tragic period without a doubt, because it's a war. There's a front line moving here and there. You have a Holocaust, you have a struggles in this territory between Poles and Ukraine, it's many things. You have a, uh, you have a, a cities which are suffering from, from famine, but basically this is the war. Bitter irony is that in 1933, there has been no war. It was peaceful times. That even in the peaceful times, Ukraine suffered much more than in war times and say unprecedentedly than most of of Western, of Western, Western Europeans. So this is give you an idea about the depth of the trauma that Ukrainians had. And uh, uh, just to uh, provide you some general statistics, uh, from 1914 to 1945, on this territory nowadays, Ukraine, every second male and every fourth female died of a violent death, which makes a third of the population has been perished by the war revolutions. You have some kind of the historical parallel. Probably the closest historical parallel will be a 30 years war in the 19th, 17th century Germany. You have the same, same size of the human losses. But still, it gives you the ideas that Ukraine in the 19th, 20th century was one of the most dangerous places to live. If you would be, have a choice to where to start be born, God forbid to you be to be born about that time in Ukraine. It was the most dangerous place. And actually, one of the say greatest miracle of Ukraine is that they managed to survive and to live even to nowadays. So therefore it's no real big uh, surprise, if I may add the, the turn to ask you for next slide, that in 1981, when the Soviet Union started to collapse, Ukraine decided to separate and to pronounce the, uh, the, the independence. They were running away from another danger for a peril of the collapse of the Soviet Union because many expected that this would be a new war. And this is the kind of the idea of the apocalypse was quite at the same widespread. I remember it very, very personally, personally. But basically, since Ukrainians felt themselves very much pro-Western and since <clears throat> they suffered a lot <clears throat> under Russian and the Soviet empire, and most importantly, they have a memories of the famine and in many cases, it was a family uh, stories. They remember very much. For a variety of this region, they decided to separate themselves from, from, from Russia and to become independent state, which they did in 1981. And each and single region of Ukraine has voted for uh, independence, including very much importantly, including Crimea. 
and Donbass. Even there, majority of local population worked for Ukrainian independence. Uh, for sure, we have next slide. The, uh, the next 30 years not turned out as it was expected. Ukrainians expected some kind of peace and well-being. It never happened. We have another 30 years of war and revol revolutions and unfortunately war. And here are many divides within Ukraine. We have a divide between Ukrainian speaking territory and Russian speaking territory. And you see kind of diagram here. And Ukraine is very much divided on many, many issues like, uh, like the uh, language spoken, like uh, the historical memory, but they might be disunited on many issues, but they always united on the main issue, which is they want to be independent. Since 1981, there has been surveys repeated regularly, and the people were asked the same question. Do you want Ukraine to be independent? You see, see these graphs on the, on the right? And answer is, is always yes. Majority always says yes, we want to be independent. There's ups and downs. Uh, downs mostly related to the economical situation. Every time comes against force, the, the, the support is getting lower, but never below 55 persons. But more importantly is the ups. Uh, uh, support for Ukraine rise every time when there is a danger of Russia, either real or imagined. This is Ukrainian wars of uh, uh, Chechen wars in Russia, when there's the first uh, surge of Ukraine of the identity. Then the first and second one, they have uh, the conflict around the uh, Tuzla, the small, the small island in the Black Sea. Then Georgian, uh, Georgian Russian war because Ukrainians felt themselves very much uh, dangerous. And the most importantly, an action in Crimea. With an action in Crimea, support to Ukraine rise sky, skyrocketed to the extent that was in 1991. So what I'm saying again, this is one of the main point, that Ukraine may be divided on many issues, like Belgians are, like Italians are, like North and South Americans are. The visas are not that much to say, uh, I'm sorry to tell it, even to some extent, North and South Korea now. But basically, they see themselves as the same nation because basically, when it comes to the, the most important strategic issues, they are very much united. And the idea of the nation is liberty and independence. So what I'm saying again, and I want to repeat it again and again, the main difference of, between Ukraine and Russia is not in the culture or in the language. They are largely similar there, or relatively similar. The main difference is the political, political character, political tradition, in the sense that Ukrainians want to be independent and they want to live free life. Let's put it this way bluntly, that uh, this difference could be explained in a simple formula. Putin is not possible in Ukraine. Maidan is not possible in Russia. And it gives you probably the basic, the, the bottom line, the, the bottom line, uh, formulation of differences between Ukraine and Russia. May I have the next slide, please? So this is exactly the first and the second Maidan, which reveal it very strongly. This crucial difference between Ukraine and Russia. You may easily know or remember, because this was not the time long ago, 10 years ago, we have also large protests in Moscow, in Bolotnaya, against Putin. Because basically the mechanism is, the, is, 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 is very, very much the same. Since the last 20, 30 years, both in Ukraine and Russia have a new generation of young people. And this generation, those are the young professionals, they middle class, and they demand more political liberties. But you have the same processes, but the outcome is very much different. While in the Moscow, this large protest on Bolotna Street largely failed, was destroyed by the Russian police, in Ukraine twice, in 2004 and 2014, Ukrainians, Maidans, managed to win. So in a way, we have been perished for this kind of differences. And may I have a next slide? Because Putin sees Ukraine, Ukrainian freedom, as an existential threat for his own regime. Because once his, one his, uh, uh, this spirit of freedom would be extended to Russia, his regime would be doomed to fail. And this is, according to many experts say, this is what stands in the stake of the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. Putin really wants to destroy Ukraine 
because Ukraine, existing Ukraine with this kind of liberty is an existential threat for his regime. So exactly this is kind of the probably shortest formulation of Ukraine identity. Freedom is our religion. You have many, you have many, you have many examples of that. You probably know that many Russians with the beginning of the war, they fell from Russia. Many stayed in Kyiv. And many says that they could be easily recognized on the street or in the cafeteria where they sit and sip their coffee because they have their passport in their pockets. Because in Russia, you could be stopped at any moment and they would check your passport. So therefore you could be ready for that. In Ukraine, there is no such a, say, habit or tradition because nobody checks you because you're a free person. So this is basically gives you gives you this kind of idea that very much Ukraine is about liberty and political independence. And may have at the last slide. And this explains why Ukraine is that much attractive. See all these places. This is a new leadership of Ukraine. All these young people, they always will be 41 years. So this is a new generation. Uh, compared to the Russian elites, Putin has a 68, 69, and uh, all those generals. This is the, 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 the difference in, in generation. In any sense, what you have now in Ukraine, as a result of the first second Maidan, you have a youth generation, youth revolution that already happened. But what's also important, actually, what is, what is there, that in Ukraine, you have a kind of the political regime which allowed these young people to rise to power. And they were marginalized. Neither of them has been any connection with the previous elites. They are professionals, uh, businessmen, uh, economists. Uh, 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 Zelensky himself has been a stand-up comic, so to say. But what is also important here, if you look at their faces and their identity, Zelensky and uh, Zelensky is a Jew. Yermak is a Russian. Arachame is a Georgian. Uh, Kim is a Korean. So what I'm saying here, this is exactly gives the sense of idea of Ukraine identity. It's not about ethnic origin. It's something which goes very much deeper. This is basically loyalty to Ukraine as a place of freedom. And they're here to stay. And they believe this is something which really uh, Putin does understand. Putin still thinks in terms of the 19th century. He thinks that language matters. The since a significant part of Ukrainian situation speaks Russian, they must be Russian. All of these people who stand here in this photo, with exception of one, are Russian speaking speakers, but they don't feel the same Russians. So what I'm saying again about these two wars, sometimes or quite often, it makes sense to understand the history better. Because once you have a, been stand better, better, you have a better chance to win the war and vice versa. When you got the history wrong, you are bound to lose the war. And this is what example of Ukraine and Russia demonstrates. Thank you so much.